Of the many ways that anime has changed over the years, I think that one of the least talked about is the disappearance of artist groups. Now, when I say artist groups, I don't mean studios or anime production houses, but rather collectives of artists, writers, and other creatives that wholly own their intellectual property. At their best, they were like Clamp, responsible for many a seminal classic like Chobits and Cardcaptor Sakura. And at their worst, they were like Orca, responsible for Gundress. These secrets are worth a fortune. Any country would be willing to pay me whatever I ask for them. <laughs> Artist groups never really had much sway in the anime landscape, but they did have a much more felt presence as opposed to today, where most intellectual property is either owned by a single artist or by an entire studio. These days, most groups are relegated to what's known as doujinshi circles, ostensibly groups of artists and writers for fan-made comics from previously established properties that can run the gamut between Final Fantasy to Harry Potter that are often, though not always, explicit in nature. While many successful manga artists and writers have cut their teeth in the doujinshi scene, Ken Nakamatsu, for instance, used to make Final Fantasy VII doujinshi, they mostly do their own thing once they have established themselves. One of the benefits of being in an artist group is that it's easier to maintain a level of anonymity, and if you're making your bones by drawing Naruto and Sasuke smut, maybe you want to be anonymous. Or maybe you want to be anonymous because you're creating a story about a teenager going on a supernatural murder spree in the name of justice and crime prevention, as is the case with one of the creators of Death Note, Tsugumi Oba. Not their real name, by the way. But today I want to lift the veil, as it were, and talk about an artist group that was made up of some of the most celebrated and most respected members of the entirety of the anime industry. Headgear. Reading the names of some of the members of Headgear comes off like an all-star lineup from the 80s and into the early 2000s. Akemi Takada, illustrator and character designer who typified and even helped define the omnipresent anime aesthetic of her time. Yutaka Izubuchi, mechanical designer who worked on nearly a dozen different Gundam titles and created freaking Razafon. Mamoru Oshii, director of the Ghost in the Shell movies. Kazunori Ito, the guy who wrote Dot Hack Sign. This shindig looks like the bomb diggity. Okay, they can't all be winners, but this is a dream team. And it's a team that was created to make one property. Pat Labor, the mobile police. A giant among giant mech anime, Pat Labor is the result of having the right people together at the right time, and is among the most successful properties of its era, spawning a manga series, an anime series, an OVA series, video games, and even a live action film and TV series, Pat Labor is the story of a squadron of cops belonging to the Special Vehicles Division 2, who use giant mechs called Pat Labors, a portmanteau of patrol and labor. Though the stories of Pat Labor circle a number of characters, they mostly center around the rookie pilot Noah Izumi and her iconic mech, the AV-98 Ingram, which she dubbed Alphonse. From dealing with eco-terrorists, construction workers and robots going amok, and even sea monsters, it's all in a day's work for the Special Vehicles Division. It's the Type Zero! Of course, Headgear was only getting started, and decided to kick it into high gear by creating two theatrically released films in 1989 and 1993. Let's try to recap all of that, shall we? From March of 1988 to October of 1989, barely more than a year and a half, Headgear had produced an ongoing serialized manga, completed an OVA series, started a TV series, and finished a theatrical film. This was the result of a concentrated and dedicated team, and it boggles the mind to see how much they had accomplished, even in the days where Marvel pumps out two different yawn-inducing TV series a year. I am so disappointed in you. So where would one start if one was interested in watching Pat Labor? Well, anywhere you damn well please, because they all pretty much tell the exact same story, only marginally separated by tone, especially if you're going to be talking about the theatrical films. Removed from the mostly lighthearted tone of the TV series and the OVA series, Pat Labor's 1 and 2 take a more methodical approach to the setting and world that these mechs reside in. They also shifted Noah's role back to being a supporting character, electing instead to focus on the police and procedural work. Pat Labor 2 in particular pays special attention to the captain of the Special Vehicles Division, Kiichi Goto. 
The films also dovetail off the OVA series continuity. That would be the first OVA series as opposed to the second OVA series, which dovetails off the anime TV series. Okay, this is getting out of hand. Bottom line is you don't need to see the OVA to understand what's going on in the films, but a lot of character interaction is written and executed with the expectation that the audience is already familiar with these characters. And as such, I don't feel like they're very good representations of the entire meta series as a whole. Again, I'd go with the first OVA series if you want that. But how do these movies function as films unto themselves? Do they even work? Well, let's start with the first one, Pat Labor 1. But first, I need to clear the air on something. A lot of old Taku look back on the Pat Labor movies with a nostalgic tear in their eye, and if you mosey about review sites, you're typically going to find a lot of kind words being said about it. Well, I'm not going to be joining them. Spoilers, I don't really care for Pat Labor 1, and I'll go into it, of course, but I feel like in this current sphere we're all in, where hot takes and X is bad actually, and here's why clickbait videos are clogging bandwidth, it's easy to write these kinds of opinions off as being in bad faith, and I don't blame you if you have that kind of attitude with me. But for what it's worth, I'm being completely honest with my criticisms, and the only thing I ask from all of you is to give me the benefit of the doubt. Besides, if I were trying to clickbait, this would be an Evangelion video. No, no, this is Pat Labor 1. And this is the oh-so-subtly-named Ark, a gigantic platform situated in the middle of Tokyo Bay, housing a number of pat labor manufacturing plants. Seems that Tokyo, in the far-off past of 1999, has been busying itself with aggressive urban development, knocking down the old to make way for the new. At least they would if Tokyo wasn't hip-deep in pat labors going haywire. Goddamn thing just won't lie down! Get the pilot out! Who are you going to call? Why, the Special Vehicle Division, of course. Who else is going to get to the bottom of this case? Just don't expect them to be using their own pat labors for over half the movie because it seems that all pat labors who've been upgraded with the latest and greatest OS are all succumbing to kill all humanitis. Just one factor was common to every case that came up. All the labors that have given us trouble that can't be explained were equipped with a hyper-operating system. Except, psych your mind, they weren't installed with the OS and they were perfectly fine and in no danger whatsoever. We can't risk using our labors with the HOS installed. Getting it out may not be the answer, but we've got to try. I never installed the hypersystem in the first place. If I'm being honest with all of you, this moment right here is pretty indicative of the main problem with Pat Labor 1. It's written pretty terribly. Considering the series up until now has been built on short-form stories, as in the OVA episodes, it's pretty apparent that they needed a way to stretch the runtime outside of the Pat Labor mechs. So they fabricated a reason why you're not going to be seeing any mech fights in the middle of the film. And sure enough, by the end of Act 1, they're gone. And by the middle of Act 3, they're back. I suppose this is an understandable problem to have, but to write them off with a lame duck excuse that they might go haywire, only for another character to come around and say they could have used them at any time is just groan worthy. Granted, this is all being a part of Goto's personality of not letting his division in on what he already knew is at least tied to his character, but it doesn't make it any less annoying or any less transparent. You really have learned how to make the guys in your section do what you want them to. You're pretty good at it yourself, but let's stick with our labor problem. So the movie is pulling the reins back on the mech battles to focus more on plot and character development. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that the plot and character development is duller than dry toast. Lest I remind you all, this is Kazunori Ito we are working with here, the guy who writes scripts like a technical manual. There's hardly any characterization here. Everyone speaks either in heavy exposition dumps or is coughing out techno babble that just does not matter at all. 50 years ago, Shinohara and I started up in business together transporting truck parts for the occupation forces. Then we started making machine tools. But we haven't got any evidence of what's going on with the labors they've sold and sent out. Given that, who knows what degree of chaos they'll cause. I don't believe we can halt the rampages just by calling the labors in and putting back the operating system. You really think Hoba didn't anticipate a simple answer like that? Blah, 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 blah. The dub script is trying its best to liven up the dialogue, but sometimes the turd to polish ratio just isn't there. 
So if the dialogue is stupor inducing, then at least the mystery of what's going on can be compelling, right? Nope. The division immediately hones in on a giant tech firm's OS as the possible culprit, and it turns out they were right on the money. Mac products are reliable, proven, and they always work. Oh yeah? What about System 7? It's coming! It's coming, okay? There were a few bugs in it, okay? There's no mystery to speak of. Hell, there isn't even a mystery of finding out who's responsible because the guy kills himself in the very first scene of the movie. There's no drama here. There's nothing pushing the stakes in the plot other than figuring out just how this OS triggers the pat labors to go berserk, which kind of misses the point. It treats the method and mechanism of the threat as the threat itself instead of, you know, the actual threat. It'd be like if The Rock halted the plot in the middle of the movie so Nicolas Cage could figure out just how Ed Harris plans to use chemical weapons. Yeah, I just said that a Michael Bay movie has better writing than this. Losers always whine about their best. Winners go home and fuck the prom queen. No, I'm not gonna take that back. If I'm being honest, a lot of my misgivings about Pat Labor 1 belong at the feet of the director, Oshii, rather than Ito. The entire premise of the plot sounds kind of ludicrous, and by the second act of the movie, when it's revealed that the cause of the Pat Labor's going haywire is triggered through vibrations in the air, and somehow or another, the malcontent who programmed the OS knew well enough that there would be a once-in-a-lifetime typhoon weeks after he killed himself that would cause reverberations throughout the arc in such a way that it would cause every single Pat Labor in Japan to go berserk, you can understand that me calling the plot kind of ludicrous is putting it charitably. But why even have this ridiculous plot line wrap around biblical references at all? Because of scheduling and recycling, that's why. Oshii plainly admitted that a lot of these story beats were based on a treatment that he proposed to Toei for a Lupin the Third movie that was never made. So he just took the finer points of the story and transplanted them into a movie that up until now had nothing to do with Christian mythology, other than the fact that Noah's name sounds like Noah from the, well, Ark. His words, not mine. So if you're Oshii and your team is busying themselves in making an OVA series, a manga series, and is in the planning stages of making a television series, and you're going to add a theatrical film on top of all of that, it does make sense to use whatever kind of story idea you have kicking around that would just go on to collect dust. I mean, on the face of it, it's not that horrible of a decision. Satoshi Kon would do the same thing when he directed Paranoia Agent, but Kon had the benefit of creating an entirely all-new series that could nest the outlandish ideas he couldn't find room for in his previous movies. Oshii, on the other hand, tried to force a round peg into a square hole just so that there could be a plot, based entirely on the shaky premise of characters' names coincidentally sounding like each other. I called Kanuka in New York and asked her to check out Hova while he was at MIT. They nicknamed him Ehova. Ehova? Which was what the Old Testament writers call God? Fundamentally speaking, the plot is very patchwork and rough, even if you ignore all the cinema sins nitpicky plot holes that perforate the narrative. Of which I tried, save for one. Like, it's one thing that characters might say or do things that don't make logical sense, but it's an entirely other thing to have characters not do something simple, all for the sake of raising the stakes, because otherwise there wouldn't be any stakes at all. They evacuate the Ark because it's full of pat labors that are ready to go forward with their robot uprising as soon as the storm hits, but for some reason, they don't turn off the defenses before they leave. Like, why? Why did you leave it up to the special vehicle division to do this when all you had to do was flip a few switches? You didn't even have to be there with them. Just leave the proverbial keys under the doormat, you blithering idiots! And while this might also be another victim of the tight schedule and budget, but it has to be said that this might be Oshii's ugliest film. The transfer I'm using from the old manga entertainment DVD isn't all that great to begin with, but even that still can't hide the fact that this film was obviously made on a budget. Animation is limited, and the visual direction was obviously guided by what would be the cheaper shot. Skirting by some good action in the final act, but otherwise, it's a drab-looking movie that falls on its face telling a muddled story that, at its heart, is supposed to be about Japanese gentrification, but is lost through a misapplied lens of Christian allegory. This old beaten-up quayside was once a wealthy suburb where guys came home in the evening, and now in a few years the bay in front of us will be filled and everything will be different. By contrast, Pat Labor 2 is the better movie just by the fact that it had advantages that Pat Labor 1 didn't. 
While Pat Labor 1 was released during the initial barrage of the OVA series and TV series, Pat Labor 2 had at least four years and an expanded budget on its hands to help couch the production. Even at first glance, the film looks leagues beyond the first film. It's also helped by the fact that it isn't anchored to a recycled plotline that wasn't all that good to begin with. But that isn't to say that the plot it does have is all that great either. In the three years that have passed since the first movie, many of the Special Vehicle Division have either moved on or are on their way out, when rumblings of a terrorist attack threaten the long-held peace of the country. While accusations fly between the different branches of the government and military, the world takes notice as Japan can't seem to get their proverbial shit together, and the U.S., being the global Bedinskys they are, threaten to hove in should Japan dissolve into martial law and civil war. On the face of it, Pat Labor 2's stakes have been raised significantly higher than in Pat Labor 1, which does a lot to make it the better movie. And it keeps building on itself, which is something that all plots really should do. However, it has to be said that while the audience feels like the tension is mounting, and there is decidedly more focus on the threat, the machinations and means of this threat is unfollowable. While we find out that the mastermind of these acts is a former soldier disillusioned with war and the fragility of peace, and we do find out right at the beginning so there's no useless mystery plot to muddle the proceedings, and we also do get a good sense of why he tried to bring war to Japan's shores after decades of peace, the exact methodology of how he carried out these acts and how he perfectly accounted for so many politicians and military leaders to make the decisions they did, it all makes Heath Ledger's Joker seem like he really was just a dog chasing cars. Sir, there are reports just coming in of attacks on bridges in Tokyo Bay. Huh? What? What do you say? Huh? Satisfied now? Now you've left it too late! It's a whole lot to go into, especially for a flyover review like this, so suffice it all to say, the movie asks you to suspend your disbelief higher than the Space Needle, but also, confoundingly, asks you to engage with it critically. Between the political maneuvering and the social engineering, the movie follows Goto, once again eschewing Noah and the rest of the pilot team to focus on the detective work. Because the last thing that a bunch of fans of giant robot anime want in their giant robot anime film is giant robots. I don't want to be that guy, but if you're going to deviate from where your series has been for the sake of exploring headier topics, then do it well, or at least better than following Goto around as he tries to find the bottom of this conspiracy, all the while entertaining the musings of one Arakawa who obviously knows more than he's letting on, if his diatribes on society's relationship with war and peace were any indication. And yet it seems to me that the line between a just war and an unjust peace is very faint indeed. If the just war is a lie, is the unjust peace less of a lie? I brought this up during my Serial Experiments Lane review, click up there if you want to see it, but that was within the context of illustrating a tangible conflict between modernist idealism versus postmodernist pragmatism. But within the context of the movie itself, it's really awkward. Kazunori Ito really has a bad habit of having these long, drawn-out scenes where he explores his own dissertations of the topic du jour, as it were, from the affirmation of identity in Ghost in the Shell to here in Pat Labor 2. True to form, if you remove these scenes from their respective narratives, they do take on a life of their own and are able to stand by themselves almost as personal mantras, capable of capturing a viewer's imagination. But as they are presented in the films therein, they kind of come off as non sequiturs, and if I'm being honest, they can even border on self serving and navel-gazing. Yes, it's interesting to hear, speaking purely on an intellectual basis, and the manga UK dub, once again, does a lot to try and inject some personality into Ito's dry, listless dialogue, but a seven-minute diversion is still a seven-minute diversion. What do you mean, start? I don't believe you haven't seen it's already begun. The question we've got to try to answer is, how will it end? Is it any surprise to hear that Ito completely removed himself from the rest of Headgear when he wrote this script? The production of the movie had gone forward under the idea that this would be the last Pat Labor project that Headgear would work on, and they would be right until nearly a decade later when they released a new OVA and Pat Labor 3 on the same day. 
But nevertheless, it's understandable that the film would have a feel of finality to it. Characters had moved on, an existential threat that jeopardizes the very concept of sustainable peace, and yet how it's executed feels like a rough draft of a Tom Clancy novel than an actual meaty plot. It has high aspirations, no doubt, and it benefits from better animation and presentation, but between so many scenes of the brass squabbling about themselves and puffing their chests while suits maintain the status quo, it doesn't really make for an involving movie. And for all of Ito's bluster and propensity to have his characters drone on and on in uninteresting dialogue, he completely forgets the fact that these characters have to be characters. When Ito is working in a group, as in Pat Labor 1, there could be moments where characters are frustrated, or they're laughing and carousing, or exhibit little idiosyncrasies that make them them. When he's by himself, they're just repositories of facts and philosophical musings that could bluster all day if you let them. Oshii does a lot to try and present these characters in dialogue with as much dramatic flair and music as he is capable of, but it's still not enough. Every once in a while, there is a good line and good exchange between the characters, but they're just drowning in a sea of tedium. But even when I put my plan into action, no one understood why. I guess even now they don't understand. Even as the final act rears its head and the pat labors return for a final mech fight, there's a distinct lack of weight because it's hard to find an emotional connection here. The conflict, while at times a physical one, is tied to idealism and what fighting in war is ultimately good for. In essence, it's a conflict about conflict, which is good for a debate, but kind of lost in the weeds when the actual bullets fly. I suppose the worst thing you could say about pat labor 2 is that it gets up its ass way too often, but between the two? I'd still give it to Pat Labor 2. It's on the whole a more cohesive film. There's nothing about it that feels out of place as far as the story is concerned, and it's presented way better than the first film. It's just too bad that it can only fire on all cylinders for about 20 minutes of the entire running time. It's a movie whose reach is beyond its grasp because it can't get out of its own way, and while that's sad, it isn't irredeemable or awful, just disappointing. As I said, if you're interested in pat labor, I'd suggest watching the OVA series and then the TV series. They're a whole lot more fun and memorable than the films are. So I think it's about time we loosen things up around here, especially with my wedding mere days away. So next time around, we're gonna crack one open and talk about comedy and anime. Till next time. <laughs>